Welcome. Welcome to the Ramdas Fellowship live stream thought song. We're excited to come together now tonight from around the world to connect to a brilliant wisdom keeper and to deepen into the teachings of Ramdas and Neem Karoli Baba. If you don't know me, I'm Jackie Dabrinska. I'm the Director of Community Outreach, Education and Inclusion for the Love Serve Remember Foundation. And you all, you are the Ramdas Satsang. You are the community, the spiritual community. And it's so important during these times. Um, spiritual community is a place where we 
come together to feed our hearts and souls. It's a place where we come together to remember in a time when it's really easy to forget in the density of everything. So one of the things we're passionate about um, in this spiritual community is feeding people. Um, and right now we're asking people to uh, feed those who are suffering from the devastation of COVID in India. Um, they're needing oxygen and other life-saving supplies. And Humanity First Foundation is determined to get in these supplies to Hyderabad to help with the second wave of the virus. So if you'd like to go donate, make sure you go to ramdas.org and it's at the top there. So tonight, um, Ramdas, so Ramdas talked a lot about interspirituality. And he said, beyond all classifications are a rarefied class of great saints who have reached the pinnacle of consciousness. They are fully realized beings, the perfect ones, the siddhas. And they come in many forms from many traditions, the Hindu Babas, the Taoist artists, Native American elders and Buddhists and Sufi poets. Each has an aspect of the one shining through. And people revere and seek counsel from these great saints and go on pilgrimages and read texts. And we in the West often lack this ingrained tradition, but we're still hungry for it, as we can see from the passion that happens when people show up around these great Sufi poets and mystics. So tonight we're going to be fed in that way. If you haven't been to a live stream before, I'm just going to give you a little outline of how tonight's going to work. Um, we'll spend about 75 minutes together. Um, Omid will come on, um, lead us in a meditation, uh, a Dharma talk, and then we'll do a live audience Q&A at the end. And you can type questions into the, whatever platform you're watching from into the chat function at any time, and then we'll try to get through as many of those questions as we can. Um, the back end, Mungla and JR sort of bring those questions to us. So those are some of the logistics. And now I'm going to invite you into the sacred space together to take a moment to recognize that you are in satsang, that you are in community with people around the world, a web of heart and souls through time and space coming together to love each other, to remember and feed people. To create space, especially when we're on these sort of electronic platforms, it's nice to get intentional. So you may want to light a candle or, you know, dim the light to somehow make it into that, that sacred space together. And as you do that, I invite you to breathe deeply and feel into the loving presence that you are. And all of these loving presences around the world, like constellations. And from that space, we welcome Omi Safi. He's part of the Ram Dass family, hosting a podcast on the Be Here Now network called Sufi Heart. He's a teacher of the Sufi tradition of radical love, and he serves as a professor at Duke University, specializing in Islamic spirituality and contemporary thought. Omid has published extensively on the foundational sources of Islam and Sufism. His memoirs of Muhammad is a biography of Prophet Muhammad, and his most recent book is Radical Love, teachings from the Islamic mystical tradition. He's also the founder of Illuminated Courses and Tours, which has taken hundreds of friends to over 20 countries, uh, to Turkey and Morocco since 2002, and I'm sure many other amazing things. So with that, let's give a lovely welcome to Omid Safi as we learn about the mystical poetry and teachings of Rumi. All right. Well, hello, friends. And I want to join the chorus of voices welcoming you to this conversation. I am touched and honored that you would take some of your precious time in order for us to be together. My hope and prayer is that this time that we get to spend talking about the extraordinary falcon of love, that is the being of Molana Rumi, uh, leaves you inspired, that it uh, heartens you, that it rejuvenates you, and it allows you to come away more aware 
of all the beautiful ways in which our lives are deeply and profoundly interconnected. In Rumi's tradition, uh, teaching oftentimes begins with stories. And these stories uh, speak to us, they touch our hearts as they have been touching the hearts of people uh, throughout centuries. Um, many of us find ourselves in very challenging situations. COVID is certainly high among that list. Those of us that have um, parts of our hearts in India, in Iran, right here where my feet are in the United States of America, there are millions of people all over this planet who have perished, millions more who have suffered, millions more that have lost their income. We are seeing an extraordinary rise in bigotry and fanaticism. And of course, our very planet, the only home that we have is burning up. So there's a lot of anguish and a lot of pain. And so to take an hour and talk about love and poetry and stories might seem like a luxury. But I would actually say that the cosmos and the universe needs you. It needs you to be at your fullest. It needs you to be at your strongest. It needs you to be at your softest, at your gentlest, most fierce and most tender at the same time. And so the stories about love that we're going to be focusing on are stories that come down to us from Rumi's own lineage. There's a lot of material that gets attributed to Rumi. Um, over the course of the last 30, 40 years, he's become perhaps the best-selling poet in the English language. Some of those translations are wonderful and accurate. Many of them are as we would say in our tradition, the soup of the soup of the soup, uh, second and third hand translation. So tonight we're gonna try to go to Rumi's own banquet and to drink deeply from the rich fountain of love that is uh, this tradition of radical love. So let's begin with a wonderful story from Rumi's own lifetime. Our friend Jackie talked about being a community, wanting to live in a sense of community, and how important it is in this day and age where so many of us have been in a quarantine, kept away from our most loved ones, that we are perhaps most attuned to the need for us to be in community. The delight that it is and it would be to embrace a friend or a family member. And in Rumi's own lifetime, he too lived in community with an intimate circle of followers. Now, Rumi's society was an elegant world. Um, people had a notion that we call adab, which is a sense of refinement, courtesy. When people would approach one another, even the hand gestures were subtle and gentle. You wouldn't be waving your hand frantically while you're talking with someone. Um, when you would be walking down the street, there was a certain way that you carried yourself as someone who is the mirror of God on earth. And yet, when you read the names of Rumi's followers, you find that a lot of his followers didn't live up to this high and lofty and refined status. They have names like Bob the Butcher, Ali the Smith, Fatima the Shoemaker. And in fact, the king of the town where Rumi lived, um, this is the city of Konya, which was the ancient Greek 
Byzantine city of Iconium, um, the city of icons. The king was very fond of Rumi, and he used to often say, I love me some Rumi. I would love to just be able to sit down with him alone, but I don't like the riffraff around him. They are rude, they are crude, they are mean, and they're ugly. Their behavior is anything but spiritually refined. Well, word about this got back to Rumi's own circle. And as you can imagine, his community was brokenhearted. They were devastated. After all, the king had called them the ultimate insult in their society, unrefined. And Rumi says to them, come with me. And he gathers up his whole community and they walk into the king's court. And he's Rumi, so he can do that. And he walks up to the king and goes, did you call my community rude, mean, ugly, and unrefined? And the king is not going to lie to Rumi, so he puts his head down in shame and says, um, I did, I did. And the community members are really excited. They think that Rumi's going to give it to the king now. And Rumi instead turns to the king and he goes, everything you said about them is true. They're rude, they're mean, they're crude, and they're ugly. At which point the community people are really confused. They're like, what the hell kind of protecting us and defending us was that? But here's why he's Rumi. He then turns to the king and says, I took them on as my students because they are rude and because they are not yet refined. If they had come to me already refined, I myself would have become their disciple. And because he is Rumi and he can do that, he breaks into song and dance and poetry and he sings this beautiful poem which says, I wander around the marketplace buying fake gold coins. Everyone thinks me mad and foolish, but I have a secret that they don't know about. What is his secret? I have the gift of alchemy. Alchemy, which you might have remembered from your high school textbooks, we used to be told that it was the ancestor of chemistry, that it could turn lead into gold, but alchemy was a mystical science. It was the science that recognizes that the whole of the universe is of one essence, that we are interwoven in a matrix of unity, and therefore that which is lowly can be transformed to that which is sublime. Alchemy is not about making gold, it's about making refined human beings, beautiful human beings. So I'm going to show you a few images from Rumi's tradition. This is the image that we most frequently see associated with the depiction of Molana Rumi, uh, our teacher Rumi, even our master Rumi. Um, in the East, sometimes he is called Hazrat. Hazrat means um, a person that when you're around them, you sense the presence of God. When you're around them, you feel closer to God. Perhaps you have someone like this in your life that when you're with them, they remind you that you are loved, that you are cared for, that you're nurtured, that you're seen. So many of us want to be seen in life. Uh, Rumi has a beautiful line of poetry that one of the great Rumi scholars, Anne-Marie Schimmel says, this might be the most autobiographical poem he ever wrote in which he says, 
I prayed so often from the heart that my whole being became prayer itself. Everyone who sees me begins to pray. And they are indeed teachers like this. It's not so much that they deliver you the teachings in a neat package. No, their whole being has become the teaching. When you're with them, you have a sense of, ah, that's what it would have been like to sit with Jesus, to have fellowship with Muhammad and with the Buddha. Every one of these teachers becomes, in a sense, a portal. They don't call attention to themselves. You are directed through them to the one. Jackie mentioned that I've had the great fortune of taking about a thousand friends over the years to Turkey. Um, our program, uh, Illuminated Tours, is currently on hold uh, because of the quarantine. So now the teaching is mainly done online. When we would go to Konya, to Rumi Shrine, this is the poem that would greet us. Baza, Baza. Harun Chahasti Baza. Come, come again. Whatever you are, come. Garko Faro Gapro Bud Parasti Baza. You are an infidel, come. You are a fire worshiper, come. You are an idol worshiper, come. In Dar Yahemo, Dar Yaheno Midimis. This gathering of ours is no place to be. Hopeless. Sad bar agar to bishakasti baza. If you have vowed a hundred times, if you've repented a hundred times and broken your vows again, come, come again. So this is an open hearted, generous invitation to come as you are to God as God is. Come with all of your imperfections. Come with all of your brokenness. Come with all of your woundedness. And in fact, when you get ready to enter the shrine, there is the sign above the door. Oh, divine presence, our teacher Rumi, and this beautiful poem. This place is like the Kaaba, the temple of God, for the lovers. All come here broken and incomplete. May all leave whole. Ka'batul ushaq bashad in maqam har ki naqis amad inja shud tamam. What is Rumi telling us? Don't wait to set out on the spiritual path until you're already perfect. No, come to God with your woundedness. Come with your brokenness. So many of us have seen all kinds of abuses done in the name of God and in the name of religion. So many of our institutions have been a place where dogma and patriarchy and racism and nationalism has been trumpeted. You might have been wounded in such gatherings. But what let you down wasn't God, wasn't love, wasn't the path. It was the fakeness that presented itself. Seek the water of life. And that water is already flowing under your feet. Rumi says at one point, all of us are like this. We are dying of lips, parched, dying of thirst. But if you look down, my child, you see that you're already standing knee deep in a river of the water of life. He gives an analogy at one point that says, 
So many of us are going around wondering, where is God? Where is God? Where is the path? You are the fish in the ocean going, where is water? Where is water? Right? The sages in Rumi's tradition, one of them from India, says, the one beloved is closer to you than the ocean is to the fish. So it's a matter of reorienting realizing that here and now, where you are, you're standing knee deep in the water of life, that the one has never abandoned you, the one is with you now, as has been forever. So we go into Rumi's shrine. It's a sacred place. It's a delightful place. And so much of the beautiful writing and calligraphy around the wall, as is done here, if you take a look, for example, at the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim that is written above Rumi's grave, it is done in a mirroring way. What is written from right to left is mirrored from left to right. It serves as a reminder that your ultimate task in life is to polish and polish and polish the mirror of your heart until you can shine divine qualities onto creation. To shine the light of God onto creation. And this is done at the heart level. Your heart is not just some lumpy flesh organ in your chest that pumps blood. No, that physical heart opens up to the spiritual heart. So one of the practices that you can do, almost every tradition has an example of this. If you're more comfortable, you can close your eyes while we do this. I invite you to take in a breath and hold it in your chest long enough until you sense the beating of your heart. When you do, release that breath. And we might repeat this breathing in and breathing out five or seven times. So, Bismillah, let us begin. you've been able to sense the beating of your heart, now return to the breath and see if you can sense that pulse, that beating of the heart throughout your body. Maybe you can sense it in your fingertips or in your toes. You see that the contraction and the expansion isn't just taking place at the physical heart, it is your whole body participating in it. So let's try for a few more breaths practicing that. So this is just the very beginning of the practice to become, our Buddhist friends would say, mindful in the Islamic tradition. We might have a different term um, for it, awareness or heartfulness, to become heartful of the beating of the heart, that the contraction and expansion of the heart are necessary. Without it, you wouldn't have that pumping of the heart. 
and the fact that in life itself, there's going to be times where your heart is squeezed and times that you experience that sense of expansion. There's a time for sadness and a time for joy. We're going to come back to that idea in a little bit. Many people, if they're familiar with some of the rituals of Rumi's tradition, it is the beautiful, meditative, slow movement prayer of the whirling dervishes, right? So here they are performing the whirling dance around Rumi's own shrine. And if you pay attention to the movement of these lovers of God in Rumi's lineage, the dervishes, the mystics, the seekers, they have trained their body the body and the breath itself, rather than being the suitcase for your spirit, has become the training ground. The whirling dance, rather than being something frantic, has become something like yoga, a deliberate and mindful and heartful awareness to the fact that they can turn for three hours without losing their balance. And if you pay attention to their hands, the right hand is always turned up towards the heavens. And the left hand is always turned down towards the earth. And the imagery is one of dancing in the rain. With the right hand, you receive the rain of divine mercy. You let it flow through you. And it can only flow through you if you've emptied yourself of the notion of finite false ego. The rain of mercy flows through you, and with your left hand, you release it onto creation. Your body has become a conduit for grace. It's not your grace. It is not your love. When Rumi speaks about love, it is not just something sentimental and romantic. Love is nothing short of the unleashing of God onto this earth. Love is the very being of Allah. It is love that created you. It is love that brought you here. It is love that sustains you here. And if you can just get over this notion that you are a finite, limited, creaturely self, you can merge into this current of love and be carried back home. And if you stop looking at the hands of the dervishes and instead look at their feet, you notice that one foot, the left foot, is always stationary. And the right foot, is making circles around it. To be a dervish, to be in this meditative state of whirling, the whole world whirls, galaxies whirl, the earth whirls, and when we whirl, we are in harmony with the whole universe. And to be in harmony with all, we have to learn to master being still, the left foot that is stationary, and being in motion. This is one of the signs that our modern world has a lot to learn about. So many of us are caught up in this trap of busyness, thinking that it is our activity that measures our worth. Well, there's a time for activity, and there's a time for repose. We have to learn to balance these two, and Rumi's tradition is part of that. Um, I have a lot more material along these kinds of teachings. They're available online um, nowadays through this Illuminated Courses. I would invite those of you who are looking for practices to uh, join us there. But let me, in the time that we have, share some of Rumi's teachings and practices with you. 
So this is the opening page of Rumi's masterpiece. This is the book known as the Masnavi, the book of rhyming couplets. By some accounts, this is among the most influential, most read, most widely commented on books in the whole of Islamic civilization. And it starts with this line. This is the book of the rhyming couplets, and it is the root of the root of the root of religion in unveiling the heart secrets of union and certainty with God. I want to call your attention and to invite you to look within about this phrase. The teachings of Rumi of the path of radical love are the root of the root of the root of the faith. He's comparing us as humans and our spiritual yearning into a kind of tree. And every tree needs to have roots and then a trunk and then branches. And then the branches give us blossoms and leaves and fruit. Rumi is asking the question, what is it that's rooting you? What is it that's grounding you? Is it, what makes me, me? Is it my health? Is it my good name? Is it my reputation? Is it my learning? Well, what if I lost some of those? Today, alhamdulillah, I am healthy. But if my health were to leave me, as someday it will. Is it my wealth? Well, I might lose some of that wealth. Would I still be me? Is it my family? That's surely more sublime than just material possessions. But what if I lost my deep connection with my family members. He's asking you to go deeper and deeper within yourself. What is it that's rooting you, that's grounding you, that's sustaining you? A tree that is not rooted will eventually wither. And a tree that is not rooted will never give fruit. He's telling you, if you're going to have a spiritual path, don't let it be a dry spiritual path. Let it be moist. Let it be supple. Let it be filled with love and with mercy. Let it give sweet, succulent, juicy fruit. And this is not a kind of what I sometimes call gospel of prosperity. Follow me and God will make you rich. Follow me and your life will be happy. Well, life is not always filled with happiness. There is pain in this world. There is genuine suffering for us, for people that we love, and for our fellow human beings. I would say any spiritual path that promises you unconditional happiness and wealth is probably selling you something. A real spiritual path tells you that the God of the mountaintop is the God of the valley bottom, that the one that sends the challenges and the suffering is the one who will comfort you. Rumi uses this meditative story. This is one of his most well-known and beautiful examples. It's the story of the Mehman Khane or the guest house. So this is an example of a guest house, sometimes also called the caravanserai. So in those days, if you were traveling in the desert or um, between two cities and you were traveling with a caravan, Every few kilometers, you would find a guest house like this, a caravanserai. It was a fortified structure 
it would be gated, the gates would open, you could go in and you could stay for one, two or three days for free. If there was another caravan there, you could do trade with them and then you would set out on your way. Rumi says, look at your own heart like a caravanserai, like a guest house. Do not so quickly identify yourself with your emotions. Think about the language that we use. How are you? I am happy. I am sad. I am angry. I happy. I sad. I angry. We're equating who we are with our emotions, with our thoughts. Don't believe everything you think. In Rumi's language, in the Persian language, if you want to ask someone, how are you? What you would ask them is, what is the state of your heart? How is your heart doing right now? What is the guest in your heart? And Rumi says, my heart is a guest house. Look, here comes the guest of joy. Joy, you are such a beautiful and delightful guest. Come on in. I so love when you visit. You know exactly where you like to sit in my heart. Make yourself at home. And I know that this too shall pass. And you will depart. Could we be equally magnanimous and gracious to sadness? Hello, sadness. You are visiting me again. There have been times of my life that no other guests have come, but you, my faithful companion, sadness, come back again and again. Come on in. I will not fight you. I will not evict you. I know that this too shall pass, and at some point you will be on your way. So what a beautiful, gracious way of treating our own heart. It's so challenging for us to be gracious and magnanimous with other people when we haven't learned to be gracious with our own emotions and our own thoughts. This is something that Rumi talks about as a sign of a mature human being. It says, you're not some piece of straw that a good stiff wind of anger is going to blow here and there. You are that solid, grounded mountain. The only thing that will move you is the face of God. He tells a wonderful story. He takes the story from the Greek tradition of Diogenes, of an old sage wandering around the marketplace, broad daylight with a lit torch, People are like, what is this crazy man doing in the broad daylight, walking around with a torch? And he says, As divodad malulam in sonam orizust. I am sick and tired of these two legged beasts and demons masquerading as human. I yearn to find a real human being. And in the oral tradition, we are told, people say, ah, a real human being. There's none of those to be found. We've searched. And the sage is made to answer, I'm either going to find one or I'm going to become one. Here's part of the mystery of being human. You already are fully and completely human, made in the image of the one, already intertwined with the whole matrix of creation. And yet, we have to become what we already are. There is a being and a becoming that is part of being human. 
So as we kind of wrap up and start moving out towards our conversation time, how do we become that which we already are? For Rumi, it's love. Radical love, as I've translated it in a book of mine. Um, This is the concept of extreme love, radical love. And uh, the analogy that Rumi uses is this strange medieval device known as an astrolabe. We don't use astrolabe nowadays, but in the medieval age, if you were traveling at sea, you were traveling in the desert, and you needed to know which way is east, which way is west, which way is north and south, this was a matter of life and death. What would you do? He would hold up an astrolabe, line it up with the stars, and he would tell you which way the coordinates are. Rumi says, Ishq astrolabe astrare khodast. It is love, radical love, that is the astrolabe of the heart secrets of God. The secrets of God you have to find in your heart. What does it mean to speak of an astrolabe? It's the GPS. Basically, Rumi's telling you, honey, we're all lost. We've all lost our way, but you have a home. And you can find your way home. And to get home, we have to live into love. When you love, you project yourself towards love and service towards another. You loosen the binds of the ego and you restore it to a harmonious place. The ego doesn't want to be harmonious. The ego wants to be the king of the world. Well, if I'm trying to be king and you are king and 8 billion humans are trying to all be king of the world, there's going to be a lot of conflict. But in love, we find the way home. I will say more about this. Um, Perhaps we can talk about this in the Q&A as well. Rumi is, of course, a devout Muslim, a lover of the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, He's often called the offspring of the soul of the Prophet. And the Prophet rises up to see God face to face and returns for the sake of humanity very much like a bodhisattva. That combination of ascension to seeing the face of God and returning for the sake of humanity, the mystical and the communal, the spiritual and the social, is very much part of Rumi's own path. Let me end with this particular story. Uh, There's a very charming story of the Layla and Majnun. These are the archetypal lovers and beloveds in the East. This is Romeo and Juliet, 800 years before Shakespeare. And Majnun is the great lover who writes poetry describing Layla's beauty. He is so enamored of her that he's just doing the mantra, the zikr of Layla, Layla, Layla. Well, words of Majnun's poetry gets to the caliph, the king, the ruler, and he falls in love with Layla's beauty sight unseen. And because he's the king, the caliph, and it's good to be the king, he summons up all of the women from Layla's village to his court. And he's tingling with excitement. It's like, oh, I'm going to see this beautiful woman. And so he finally the day comes and he marches into the court and he looks at this gathering and he's expecting one of them to stand out above the others. And he looks to the right, and he looks to the middle, and he looks to the left. But they all look pretty average. They all look what my college students call normies, basic. No one of them stands out. And the caliph is confused and he turns to his advisor and says, did you bring Layla? Uh, Your majesty, not only did we bring Layla, we brought all the women. 
And so the king addresses the woman and says, is one of you all Layla? And then the real Layla steps forward. And the king looks at her, very average looking woman. He thinks about the poetry that Majnoon has been composing. It doesn't match this very average looking woman in front of him. And he looks at her and goes, you? You are Layla? And Layla, in this tradition, the women talk back. Layla says, I am Layla. But you, you are not Majnun. And then Rumi fills in. In order to see the beauty of Layla, you have to learn to look through the eyes of Majnun. In order to see the beauty of Layla, you have to learn to look through the eyes of Majnun. So we're going to end Rumi's discussion and move to our Q&A with this reminder. The body, just as we saw with the whirling dervishes, is not a suitcase. It's not an obstacle. It's a training ground. What would it be to train our eyes to see the beauty of Layla in one another? What would it be to train our ears to listen for the real intention of what someone is trying to convey to us? What would it be to train our breath so that every breath is taken with awareness of the realm of the spirit? What would it be to train our touch so that when we touch another human being, it is never to grab, but only to comfort and to delight. And in today's day and age, what would it be like to train our tongue, our mouth, or our keyboard? So that when we speak with one another, it is only to bring out that which is lovely and that which is beautiful. These are part of the spiritual practices of Rumi's lineage. Um, and those of you who are interested in going more in depth, I would love to invite you to, to join us. Um, I mentioned that I have a whole online course. Um, you can follow it along at your own pace. You can see it at illuminatedcourses.com. And it's open and available to everyone from any part of the world. Um, there's a separate course on the Quran as well. Let me pause here. And perhaps at this point, I would love to turn it back to Jackie and see if we have some questions that we can um, invite from our mm -hmm. friends. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, thank you. There's such brilliance in um, hearing all that and the um, that the speak of um, you speaking of beauty and love, like it invites the nervous system to relax and to step into that. Oh, it's really, really quite lovely. Um, we have a few questions coming through. And one of the, the first that I just want to ask is you talk a little bit about um, Rumi's own refinement, and a little bit about the context of the culture. Um, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that, about the 13th century, what was happening in the world at that time, as well as who are his teachers? How did he come to this place? Yeah, thank you so very, very much. Um, what a wonderful question. So, you know, the tradition that I um, am most familiar with is the spiritual tradition of Islam. And if you're going to talk about the two giants of Islamic spirituality, of course, after the Prophet Muhammad, um, peace be upon him, um, one of them is Rumi, and the other one is the Andalusian sage, the Spanish sage, Ibn Arabi. Uh, they're more or less contemporaries and living in the 13th century. So what's happening in the 13th century? 
I mention this not to turn this into a history lesson, but sometimes we look at our own world and we say, my God, there is COVID and we just got over four years of Trump and there is economic crisis and there are racial tensions and the planet is melting and no one has ever suffered the way that we're suffering today, right? Um, and for somebody who is suffering at that moment, our task is never to minimize their pain, right? Is never to say, well, you know, other people have also suffered, right? Uh, no, you, you sit in silence and you witness their pain. Mm-hmm. You practice um, what the Sufi tradition calls I love this word, Um, withness. You are with them. Um, Ibn Arabi says at one point that in the day of judgment, God summons up human beings and says, I was thirsty and you did not give me water to drink. I was hungry and you didn't give me food to eat. I was sick and you didn't visit me. And the people are very confused and they say, our Lord, you are the God of the whole entire cosmos. How could you be thirsty? What does it mean that you were hungry? What does it mean that you were sick? And Ibn Arabi records God as responding to them. If you had gone to the hungry, you would have found me with them. If you had gone to the thirsty, you would have found me with them. And if you had gone to the sick, you would have found me with them. This is what the Sufis call withness. Um, that notion that God is closest to those who are hurting. So there's personal communal hurting. And in Rumi's age, on one hand, you have the Crusades. And on the other hand, you have the Mongols. Right? We're talking about devastating destructions that is wiping out millions and millions of lives in his age. What is Rumi's response that society can be restored, that community can be healed through love? As long as we don't reduce love only to physical, sexual, romantic love. That's one layer of love and a rather thin layer of love. After all, um, as I sometimes jokingly say, um, unless you and your partner are much more open-minded than me and my wife are, you're supposed to have that kind of love with one person. (laughs) But there's 8 billion people on earth. So wouldn't you want to have a more expansive kind of love that would allow you to love radically and fully all humans, animals, plants. Um, Rumi says at one point, even about things that we would consider things. He says, you look at the earth, you think the earth is dead, but I tell you the earth is living. So... Uh, there is that tradition, that expansive circle of love that relates to um, to all. And Rumi's own age witnessed so much trauma and so much suffering. So does our age. And I, I still think love understood in this expansive way is the remedy. Mm, such a poignant message for right now and what's happening. And really nice to have that context. I love that idea of witness. I think I think that's the root of compassion too. That's right. To be that's right. with there is, in the Christian tradition, there's an almost identical verbatim teachings um, because, of course, all these sages are ultimately drinking from the same fountain. Yeah. Well, it's actually a question that I came up earlier when you were speaking. Um, we have lots of other questions, but because it's the lead-in, I'm going to ask this. Um, you talked about like the patriarchy and the, this like. Um, that, that how that comes through a lot of traditions and harms people. Um, and 
And we, and I think some of that comes through, like just the way we choose to translate, like um, the meek shall inherit one of the, the Aramaic word, like one of it ways that it translated as empty, mm. talk about that emptiness. Um, but it seems like this tradition escaped that fate in some way. Like when we read the poems, I, I don't get those same sense. Is, is that true? To some extent, to some extent. Um, even though this is the tradition that has given light and meaning to my own life, um, I don't pretend that any tradition is entirely exempt from this. I think um, all of us share the same fate. We're in the same boat. And the boat, as I see it, is imagine if you're standing in a fountain, in a gushing fountain of love and compassion and wisdom, and at the same time, you're trying to drink from this fountain and to cleanse this fountain. Mm. All of our traditions have come down to us through a process of transmission, these unbroken chains, sage after sage after sage. You are who you are because your teacher was taught by someone who was taught by someone, and this extends all the way back. And our traditions have also, every single one of them, brought to us tribal notions, patriarchal notions, at times, nationalistic notions, notions that take the god of the infinite cosmoses and try to make it seem like, well, there might be more galaxies than there are grains of sand in the desert, but that god of the infinite cosmoses really loves this tiny, tiny percentage of humanity way above and over everybody else. That's a small god. And I don't want a small god. Uh, you know, this wonderful Muslim phrase, Allahu Akbar, God is great, God is greater, and God is the greatest, God is supreme. You begin prayers by putting up your hands, Allahu Akbar, God is greater. Whatever ideas, finite conceptions that have come to prayer with, the first thing I have to do, Allahu Akbar, is to release them. Because I cannot go to the infinite God who's been trapped in a limited idol that is our conceptions of God. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, Amy asks, is it helpful to understand why we are lost, why we suffer? So why it's so common to suffer? Because we forget. Because we forget. Because we keep thinking that you are this fleshy creature. We keep thinking that you are this finite creature. And for most of us, we either live in denial of death or we try to compensate it by an over-embrace of perhaps the physical tantalizing um, one of the things, I never had the great uh, fortune that many of you did to meet Ram Dass in, in person, but one of the things that I loved about him was the grace with which he aged, mm -hmm. even after his physical body was falling apart. That notion, and you know, there's very concrete spiritual practices that um, the Indian a Sufi tradition uh, in particular has. And I'll just share you with you one on one simple one. Maybe this would help Amy as well. Um, so we are observing the month of Ramadan for those of us who are Muslim and able to fast. And um, the hour of sunset has, has come here. So if I were interested, I could take a cup of water that I have right here with some mint from our garden. And I could take a sip. And it's very refreshing. Now, six hours before, that same water was flowing in the pipes in my house. And two weeks before that, it was perhaps being purified in a factory. And a month before that, it might have been flowing in a river. And six months before that, it might have fallen down from the heavens from a cloud. And 
because we're trying striving for refinement. We won't get very graphic, but a few hours from now, the sip of water that I just took will no longer be in my body. It will find itself mysteriously, miraculously, back to some pipes, back into a stream, back into an ocean where it's going to evaporate again to the cloud. So this water has been moving through the universe and calling my body home for a period of time. So it is with air. So it is with all the food and sustenance that I take. So it is with breath. So everything that right now is a part of me at some point belonged to the wider nature and it will never disappear. It will return back to nature. This is what Rumi says, why should I fear death? I've already died a thousand deaths before. When was I ever made less through dying? Mm. Um, so there is that embrace of the infinite. Mm. Um, and the letting go of that fear that is so pervasive in so much of our culture. Mm. Very much so. Um, someone, let's see, Layla, I believe, she asked, could you offer some words of wisdom regarding how one contains a loving, compassionate, and gentle heart during such times of extreme isolation? Where is the outlet? What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful uh, question. Um, how I would love to meet these friends who are asking these questions face to face so that we could honor each other um, by sitting together in silence. Um, there's something a little artificial about the urge with which we try to offer um, wise answers on the spot. But since time is finite, even if we are not, um, here's a couple of things Rumi has to say. He at one point uses the analogy that if you are casting out seeds, that seeds cannot take root if you scatter them on a hard stone. Mm -hmm. That seeds can only grow in soft soil. And so he then turns to you. Every story that he tells you, it's about you. And he says, you've tried being a stone-hearted man. You've tried being hard as a rock. Now try being soft like the soil and look at the verdant, green, lush roses that can grow in your heart. To come back to Layla's question, I'm sometimes reminded that in today's world, particularly in confronting injustice and atrocity, sometimes we think that the only MO that we have is to be hard, is to be strong. Mm. Well, perhaps there's a time and a place for that. But some of the strongest people that I know are also the gentlest. The strongest of trees know how to bend in the wind. It's the brittle tree that will so refuse to bend that it will eventually snap in two. So in terms of today's world, Rumi uses this analogy at one point. He says, be like water says, if you pour down any water, water always gravitates down. He says, this is the way of love. This is the way of compassion. He says, always gravitate towards the people who find themselves lowly. Mm -hmm. And recognize that the world is not divided between the good people and the ugly people, but that these are all qualities that percolate inside every one of us. So when you come across another person, rather than looking at them as the devil, 
or whatever the worst attribute is that you could associate with someone. And I had a few choice ones coming to me. Um, see them as someone who is struggling and see if you can be a participant in bringing out something that is beautiful in them. And at the same time, know your limits. Honor the boundaries. I think one of the biggest mistakes that so many of us make, especially early in our path, is to treat ourselves as a being who has the responsibility to heal everyone without tending to our own heart. Yeah, it's, I, I so agree that that importance of remembering that we're human and we're all trying to figure it out. Right. And, and even we were speaking of the word devil and um, the worst thing you can imagine. And some, I, sometimes I'm just like, even this idea of that they're enemy or other, when, even that can bring in b- b- bitterness um, and br- brittleness is what I meant to say. Um, and just um, that idea of the friend in everyone. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, that, that um, as, as uh, a sage that is dear to our hearts, we're all trying to walk each other home. Right. Um, imperfect, flawed beings um, on the same journey. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's two questions here that are kind of similar around being around others um, when you're on the path, around, especially with others who aren't necessarily supportive of it, um, reactive, emotional in various ways, um, and how to stay true to, to that, um, what I'm guessing would be the radical love. And maybe that's some of the boundaries or recognizing your own boundaries, but maybe there's something more you want to say about that. Yeah, he does. Um, He has a wonderful way of talking in this very direct way about you and I. Mm. You and I. And what he does is to say that what you actually have to cultivate is the wisdom, the discernment that you have to know yourself and you have to know the situation. And then you have to figure out what is the right ethic in each situation. Sometimes the right response is to say, what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours, right? Um, Someone breaks into your house and they're going to harm you or your loved ones, right? That's a time in which you say, no, no, no. Our lives and our dignity, like this is ours and that's yours. And if people would only follow that, well, we wouldn't have war, we wouldn't have theft, we wouldn't have rape, we wouldn't have murder. It might seem like the lowest of spiritual levels, but it would sure make this planet much less pain-filled than it is. The next level up is what's yours is yours, what's mine is also yours, right? So we're sitting down together, and I see this firsthand when I'm in Rumi's uh, circle in Turkey. People will be serving chai, serving tea, and you don't actually sweeten your own cup of chai. They give you the sugar, and you take it, and you put it in the cup of the person to your right. And they take it and put it in the cup of the person to their right. And round and round it goes until it comes back to you. With the reason being, if God forbid, God forbid, this be the day that we run out of sugar, let it be me who has to drink tea without sugar. What could be worse than to drink (laughs) sweet tea, right? Now, we as Americans have a real hard time with this because they're like, how does that other person know how I like my tea? Maybe I like two lumps. Maybe I like three lumps. Individuality. Me, myself, and I are the best of the term. No, what's yours is yours. And then let me also offer what I have to you. I am a baba. I'm a father of a newborn child. Every one of us is alive today because somebody loved us. Somebody sacrificed for us. Somebody got up in the middle of the night for us. In our case, it's mostly my wife. She goes, let's go of her own rest and her own sleep to tend to someone that doesn't even have the language to ask for. But even that 
mine and yours is not the final step. He says the ultimate step is when we let go of mine and yours, or even a notion of you and I. You see all of us as intertwined, interconnected, mirror to mirror, right? So if you just jump to that level and it's not reciprocated, it could be disastrous. But if you're in a partnership, in a fellowship, in a community with someone, then you get to the level of this beautiful poem that Rumi has, you and I should live as if you and I never heard of a you and an I. You and I should live as if you and I never heard of a you and an I. I love that. Um, I recently read that there is some study, this is, someone's going to have to double check me on this, Um, but the whales and dolphins don't think of themselves as individual beings. They think of the I is the pod. It's one of the theories of why dolphins come to save people is they hear the, I'm in trouble. And they're like, I must, you know, like right hand helping, taking the left hand out of the fire. And I love that. It's a beautiful idea. And, and you know, that this is the, um, the analogy that um, is so vivid in our life. And it's vivid in my life right now. Um, our baby gets up in the middle of the night crying because she's hungry or because she's pooped herself or whatever. And what is our response? I tell you what we don't do. We don't sit there at the edge of the bed, grab a notebook and make a chart of the pros and cons of actually tending to this child. You don't sit there and go, well, you know, um, the last time that I slept for eight hours was the year 2020. And therefore, I think we're just going to let this child go. No, you don't do that. You leap into direct action. Yeah. And that's why there's a level of sanctity about that kind of an action. When you project yourself in love and care and service and you refuse to be compassionate by proxy to somebody else. Um, We're going to go a little bit long. We said 75 minutes, but there's so many great questions coming in that we're going to ask one or two more. Wonderful. Close up. Um, so this is sort of going in a little bit different of direction, but two or three different people had um, a question about Rumi's relationship to Shams and to, yeah. I'm not going to say the other one right, to Biz, to Baz. Tabriz, yeah. Yeah, we can talk about yeah. that a little bit. It's a, what a wonderful, wonderful question. So um, the way that people used to tell the story of Rumi was um, that he was this boring scholar before, and then he meets this charismatic, enigmatic, difficult person, Shams, and Shams rocks his world, and he turns Rumi into this fiery mystic. Um, We know today that it's not quite so simple. Rumi's own father was an extraordinary mystic, um, uh, Bahauddin, who has the whole visionary experience of God. But there's no question that Shams does something to Rumi. Um, Rumi's 37 years old when he meets Shams. And... What Shams encourages Rumi to do is to take all of the extraordinary knowledge that he has had before and to combine it with lived experience. So he tries to reconcile the scholarly and intellectual with this radical love tradition. Shams is... Um, a brilliant teacher and someone who doesn't suffer fools easily. Um, He uses the analogy of you cannot find your way to God using someone else's experience. Mm. Right. Um, 
the analogy that the Sufi tradition uses a lot. Interestingly enough, the Jewish tradition uses the same analogy for the Torah is imagine someone bringing a bowl of honey in front of you, right? They could write H-O-N-E-Y on the board and be like, oh, look at how sweet that is. Well, it's not. They could write the chemical composition for honey on the board and you're not going to go lick it. And Shams's take on it is that what most religious traditions are is that there's a prophet or a sage who has the bowl of honey and he puts his finger in the bowl of honey, puts it in his own mouth, and he goes, mm, I do declare that this honey is so sweet. And then you and I sit here and we go, I do declare that he tasted honey. And that honey is so sweet. And Sham says, you have a mouth and you have a finger and the bowl of honey is in front of you. Put it in your own mouth. Right? It's not a call to do away with tradition or with transmission. But the analogy that he uses and his language is so vivid. He says, why are you walking with someone else's walking staff? Why are you riding a horseless saddle. Mm. God has given you a horse and that's your breath and that's your spirit, right? And so these are some of the gifts that uh, Shams is able to give Rumi, bringing his full genius to fruition. Um, if you have time for one quick Rumi and Shams story, I'll, I'll, I'll share this. Um, it's sometimes a little uh, disappointing for me that we have so few models in our contemporary society of men being affectionate with one another, that the minute you have Rumi and Shams speaking to one another in language of love, the mm. only way that people know how to make sense of this is to say, well, they were gay, right? Um, no, they weren't. And Rumi is very clear about that. In fact, he writes beautiful poems about his teacher, Shams, he also writes maybe even more beautiful poems about his wife. But what is so fascinating is one day Rumi is sitting there reading a very difficult book of Arabic writing. And he's sitting by a well in his garden and Shams comes by and Shams is like, what are you doing? And Rumi's like deep in study and he's like, ah, don't bother me. I'm reading. And Shams is like, what are you reading? And Rumi's like, you wouldn't understand. And Shams is like, okay. He waits for a second. And then right when Rumi's not looking, he snatches the book out of Rumi's hand and throws it down the well next to Rumi. Now, Rumi is frightened, angry, upset, and he goes, what are you doing? Right? In this tradition, books are sacred. Mm. Ink is sacred. Mm. Paper is sacred. Writing is sacred. And there were no printed books. Right? Well, up until the middle of the 19th century, every single book was a manuscript, handwritten. And if you wanted a copy of this book, it would take six months for someone to copy it. And so Rumi's like, I just had this one copy of the book and he threw it down the well. What are you doing? Well, these are the kind of stories. Shams reaches down the well, brings out the book out of water. Of course, it is unharmed. Mm. Hands it back to Rumi and he goes, you wouldn't understand. Right. So he turns around that you wouldn't understand of Rumi, this is so difficult scholarly knowledge, with that you wouldn't understand. There is knowledge that comes in books, and there's knowledge that comes by the people who become the books. Mm. Um, we see this in the mythology and the stories around us. If you watch The Last Jedi mm -hmm. movie, right? Yoda. Yoda is a Sufi master. I don't care what anybody says, right? <laughs> and Luke at one point freaks out because somebody has burned down the book of the ancient Jedis. And Yoda's sitting there laughing. And 
Luke is like, why are you laughing? They just burnt our last precious books. And Yoda's like, in front of you, you have someone who is the living embodiment of all these books. Mm. Now, this is a tradition that only makes sense if you remember that books are sacred. If the book had no value, then throwing it in the well and pulling it out and saying that you wouldn't understand would make no sense. Mm. It's because it is such a sacred process that we have to also, in some ways, transcend it and internalize it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. So because we're over time, uh, I just want to ask one last question. And there's so many great questions that we could be asking um, you right now. I'm sure we could go for another at least half hour or more. Um, but you spoke about the honey. So the last question is, how do we each learn to taste that honey every day? What are the things that we can do? How do we step into to radical love? Wonderful, wonderful question. Wonderful question. Um, so here's the way that Rumi's tradition invites you. Explore your heart. Get to befriend your heart. Examine your heart. Open it up and ask yourself, what is it that nourishes me? What is it that sustains me? What feeds my soul? Um, when I teach at the university, I ban laptops and I ban cell phones. Um, part of that is because in-person teaching, we want to establish this mystery of eye to eye, face to face, heart to heart. And for my students, after they've been in class for 75 minutes, which is a little bit less than what we've all been together, and they get up and they're a little bit like drug addicts. Like their hands are like physically trembling because they can't wait to get their phones out and check to see did anybody tag them? Does anyone text them? Does anyone remember them? Yeah. Right? Now, the worst thing that could ever happen to them is if their phones run out of battery. Mm -hmm. They will sit, and we've seen this in those days that we were, many of us were in airports. You will see people sit on the ground next to a bathroom if that's the only plug that they can find to recharge their phone. Mm -hmm. They will put up with all kinds of hideous odors coming from there if that's what it takes to recharge their iPhone. Mm -hmm. When was the last time that we took such care for our hearts? Mm -hmm. Do we know ourselves well enough to know what rejuvenates us? For some of us, it might be prayer. For some of us, it might be meditation or yoga. For some, it might be reading poetry or sacred music, putting your feet in a stream or listening to the sound of birds in the garden or going for a walk in the woods, cuddling with a lover, listening to the giggles of your newborn or having your mama's cooking and gazing deep into her eyes. It matters less to me what that practice is, but it is essential that we return and return and return to that practice until it becomes a habit. And to remember that what fed your soul when you were 20 may not be what feeds your soul when you're 30 or 40 or 50. That what fed the soul of your ancestors might be what feeds your soul, and it may not. Mm. To keep examining and nurturing, and to always ask that question, is this about nurturing the soul, or is it about feeding my ego? Is this something that is making me softer, more loving, more oriented towards service, more harmonious with other human beings and the natural cosmos, closer to God? 
Or is it about tantalizing and entertaining and distracting? I think that's probably one of the most essential of the spiritual practices that I can think of. And fortunately, we're not alone. Fortunately, we are heirs to these multiple spiritual traditions with so much wisdom, so much insight. And um, I know this is what all of us are trying to do. It's what I've tried to do in these illuminated courses that are online. It's what I try to do on the podcast that be here now. It's what all of us are trying to do in our own way. Mm-hmm. So beautiful. Uh, when you speak about it, it, it um, brings to mind this idea of the sensuality of it, like being nourished by the senses. Yes. Various things. And also this idea of having to be courageous to oh, against the shoulds that we are so um, entwined in. It should, yes. This should be different or it should be this way. I, I love that word courageous mm-hmm. because it has ko in the beginning and core means heart. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes we think about being courageous as like bungee jumping or jumping off an airplane. No, courageous means have heart. Like, have heart, my beloved. You are made in the image of the one. Mm. You are destined for a perfect goal. Mm. Your very body is literally made up of the stars. You are a cosmic being with a built-in heart to find your way. Mm. Have hope. Have heart. Mm -hmm. so beautiful it has been such a pleasure and joy and so rich to have this conversation with you tonight so thank you so much for bringing your wisdom absolutely yeah and thank you to the people in the back end who helped make this event possible and big thank you to all of you for being here and tuning in and giving an hour and your an hour and a half of your life to to deepen into this um, if you want to continue to see events like this, please consider supporting financially by going to ramdas.org slash donate. We give most, if not all of our events away for free, and we can only do that if people are also able to, to donate. Um, you can rewatch this live stream at any time with your friends, family, anyone you think might um, get something from it. You can find it at ramdas.org slash live stream replays or whatever you're watching from. And if you want to dig deeper into community and have conversations and talk about interesting things together. Um, Make sure you sign up for the Ramdas Fellowship. That's ramdas.org slash fellowship and you'll get invites to our monthly virtual meetups as well as our affinity groups and those happen each month. Um, And if you want to dive deeper into Ramdas teachings, there are five more days to sign up for our eight-week class, The Life and Teaching of Ramdas. And it's lots of great archival lectures, three live events each week, mantra, meditation, um, and Omid will be part of that as well. So that will be the um, compassionate heart, I believe, is what you're talking about. So again, thank you all for being with, with us here this evening. We look forward to seeing you at upcoming events. And also, um, we've got some other live stream. We had a great music series that just ended, and you can see all of those um, artists as well on the replay page. So and check out your tours and podcast and all the great courses you have coming up. So, You're all welcome. Yeah. So much gratitude.
Yeah. 